tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. The Hero of My Story by Chip Jett Read by John Rogers I am the hero of my story because I killed a werewolf. That's the lie my best friend made me promise to tell. But it isn't true. I'm not the hero, and the story doesn't start there. It starts in my third year of elementary school when a new kid came to town and changed my circle of friends. By circle of friends, I mean me and Keith Uren. Keith was my best friend until Amber arrived. It probably made him a little jealous that Amber and I hung out, but what can I say? I had more in common with her than with him. But when you're eight and in third grade, no one looks twice if boys are friends with girls. It's as natural as the sun and the moon, and nobody pays any attention. Well, almost nobody. My mom noticed. She liked Amber from the start and said she could see it in her eyes that Amber was, as mom said, a keeper. My mom always said the eyes were a window to the soul, and I took that to heart. Amber's eyes were the iciest blue I had ever seen, and I guess that's what drew me to her. Do you wear contacts? I remember asking. We were at lunch her first day, and I had saved her a seat. Contacts, she said. Do these look like contacts to you? She stared at me then, and I knew exactly what mom meant. Somehow, without question, I knew this girl. That's not to say Keith didn't eventually warm up to Amber when he realized she made for a better bionic woman on the playground. That sealed the deal. From then on, the three of us were inseparable. But if push came to shove, Amber and I were the two peas in our friendship pod. The three of us lived within walking distance of one another, and we were all in walking distance of the school. In the days before the werewolf, we walked there and back every day. Each afternoon at 2.30, we three would meet beyond the merry-go-round and the ant hills at the edge of the woods. Before the werewolf, we were never afraid. A short path through the woods came to a dirt road on the right, chained against trespassers. At the end of the road were cliffs overlooking an abandoned quarry and a river below. Called Oak Mountain, it was the highest point in the county. With special permission, photographers used it for senior photos. Couples used it for its seclusion. We three were young. On Oak Mountain, our imaginations ran wild. We used to pretend we were being chased by monsters, or a lunatic, or Freddy Krueger. We ran madly up the trails and to the cliffs, and we fought impossible foes. We were kids, and we were invincible. It was 1982, the year Duran Duran sang Hungry Like the Wolf. Simon Le Bon wasn't kidding. I still wonder what he knew. And so, my story begins in the summer before ninth grade and high school, when my best friend Amber disappeared. The police never found her body, but the trailer where she lived had been destroyed. This was common knowledge, too, because it was printed in the paper. The door had been ripped from its frame, the inside ransacked. Black and white newsprint photos showed the cottony insides of sofas and chairs, shredded, covering the lawn like a low-hanging bank of clouds. 
claw marks tore into the paneling on inner walls, and experts declared samples of fur a perfect match for that of Canis Lupus. Wolf Blood samples matched Amber's family DNA, and it was assumed they all were killed. Nothing was left. My best friend became werewolf victim number one. Though many have forgotten now, or written it off to hysteria, our little town believed without shame, without embarrassment, in a werewolf. We knew the beast existed, even if the rest of the world looked at us askance. The werewolf ruined ninth grade for me and for everyone at school. The only saving grace was our English teacher, Miss Hughes. She was older, probably close to retirement, but I believed her eyes were a window looking onto a soul of pure kindness. She was also the voice of reason amidst the fear and worry we all felt. She didn't shy away from calling it what it was. Mrs. Hughes used to tell us that myths always had some basis in reality. That's why they scare us, she said, because the stories are, in some form or fashion, true. Our town suffered mightily. Every month, two or three residents made the papers. Sometimes bodies were found, sometimes not. The werewolf didn't discriminate. It took livestock and librarians, pets and politicians. Nobody was safe. Because of this nightmare, our town changed. No one left home alone. Friday night football games moved to Saturdays in the sun. Kids didn't trick or treat and 24 hour stores ceased to exist. What we did, we did in the daylight. Eventually, everyone claimed, and truthfully so, to know someone who had been killed or who had disappeared. For a while, Amber's death was my greatest loss. And then the beast huffed and puffed and blew my own house down. One afternoon at band practice, I got the news that my mother hadn't shown up for work. Her boss at the shop and save, Mr. Rooney, called the police to file a report. They searched our house, the house where mom and I had lived for 12 of my 15 years, the house where I learned most of what I knew of the world. They searched the house, but couldn't find my mom. Tracks the sergeant said when I got home that day. Big ones, too. The sergeant put her hand on my shoulder and said, I'm sorry, Russell, but it's the work of the werewolf. She took a card and wrote on the back. Find somewhere to stay, she said. With so much activity here lately, there's really nothing I can offer you. You'll have to take care of yourself. She nodded at the card, now pinched between my thumb and finger. That's my home number. You call me, even if it's late, and I'll do what I can. Miss Hughes' expertise on the subject was thin. Nobody knew if the wolf worked alone or if it was part of some kind of pack. On one point, however, everyone agreed. Someone among us knew the truth. Someone in town was a werewolf. I don't believe werewolves were invented in my hometown. A quick glance through history can confirm as much. No, werewolves have always been, and people have always known. Maybe it's a taboo subject. Maybe truth morphs into legend. But the truth is undeniable, and somebody, somewhere, always knows the truth. Always. Amber's loss didn't exactly bring Keith and I closer together, 
We'd always been friends, but her absence left new spaces of time for us to figure out how to fill. With the town on a virtual lockdown, we had few options outside of school to keep ourselves occupied. One thing that didn't change, however, was our habit of walking home after band practice. We felt safe in the afternoon sun, and I guess we were, at least until Keith decided to tempt fate a little too much. It was the Friday after my mom was taken and band practice ended early. Time changes in a week, Mr. Calhoun said, so I want us in the habit of wrapping things up by four. No sense any of you kids becoming the werewolf's next headline. Keith and I put our saxophones away, gathered our books and jackets, and took off. The path home hadn't changed at all from our elementary school days. The only thing different was a new sign, swinging from the chain blocking the dirt road of Oak Mountain. It read, Werewolf Activity, No Trespassing, By Order of the Sheriff. Except for a couple of bodies found strewn along its ditches, there was little proof the werewolf called Oak Mountain home. Hunting parties had taken turns searching the mountain and its cliffs, but came up empty. Everyone knew the likelihood was that the monster retreated to a neighborhood three-bedroom ranch when its deeds were done. Still, a town that believes in a werewolf has no problem believing that the wolf lives on its scariest hillside. You think the werewolf eats the people it kills? Keith asked when we passed the sign-bearing chain. I don't know, I said, a little surprised he even asked. We never talked about Amber, and he'd only mentioned Mom once, saying he was sorry to hear the news. But the truth is, I had wondered the same thing a thousand times before. They never found Mom, I said, kicking at Nant Hill, or Amber. I don't know. They found Mr. Calhoun's wife, and they found the mayor. I mean, how does it decide who to leave and who to take? We stopped to listen to the woods. Just talking about it made us sweat a little, made our skin tingle with electricity. We kicked at more ants and watched them scramble. Keith took a stick and let one crawl onto it. He tipped it over an antlion's mound and gave the stick a shake. We watched the ant struggle, watched the ant lion kick dirt at the bottom of its lair, forcing the ant down, down. It's brutal, Keith said. He probably meant my mom, or Amber, or maybe the ant. I knew he felt bad for bringing it up. Yeah, I agreed. The day grew long. I don't remember slipping under the chain or wandering too far off the trail, but we did. When the first sounds came to us that were not born of our imaginations, we knew we'd gone too far. Did you hear that? Keith asked. There were no birds, no leaves in the breeze. Silence surrounded us. And then breathing, heavy in the deeper woods and then footsteps, needlessly crunching dead sticks, and then a low, deep growl. We took off together, both of us clearing the chain in a leap. At some point, I realized Keith was no longer with me. I still heard crashing in the trees, though, and hoped it was him. The sounds kept pace with me until I reached the edge of the trail. I burst from the tree line in a cloud of leaves and spider webs. I didn't stop until I reached my house, second on the right from the end of the cul-de-sac. I knew nothing had come with me from the path. No werewolf, no Keith. I was alone. My hand on the front door, I turned to the woods and strained to hear. No sound escaped the trees. Keith! I tried to yell. His name choked in my throat and came out in a whisper. I tried again, and this time his name had a high-pitched hysterical quality to it. Keith! I shrieked. 
It was panic, I suppose, for I was indeed panicked. By then, the sun was riding the horizon, almost out of town, but still waiting around to see what would happen. A dusky haze, nearing dark, crept along my street, and porch lights were on. There was no sign of the moon. In spite of the last lingering daylight, a howl rose from the depths of Oak Mountain. Up and down my neighborhood, porch lights turned off. Locks turned and chains rattled into place, terrified neighbors desperate to hide. I stood on my porch and scanned the trees for Keith. Lance Giles photographs most of the seniors for the yearbook on and around Oak Mountain. It was Lance who found Keith's body the next day, strung across the chain blocking the dirt road. He hadn't been eaten. Rather, the werewolf had left Keith behind, like a message. Stuck to what was left of his shirt was a note, only one word written in blood. It said, Russell. Lance Giles called the police, of course, but he gave the note to me. I think this is something you need to deal with yourself, he said. Maybe you're the hero. Maybe you can put an end to this nightmare. The next day after school, I took the note to the only person left I felt I could trust. It wants you, Russell, Miss Hughes said. For some reason, it knows your name, and it wants you. I turned to leave, but Miss Hughes put a strong hand on my arm. Her eyes were still kind, but there was something else behind them. Determination, maybe, or fear. I couldn't be sure. The blinds had been drawn on the windows of her soul. You aren't walking home, are you? She asked. It's not safe. Your way home goes by Oak Mountain. What big hands you have, I thought. No, ma'am, I lied. Mr. Calhoun will give me a ride home after practice. I probably intended to ask Mr. Calhoun for a ride, but I didn't. Instead, I hung out in the band room, talking, trying in vain to ignore Miss Hughes' warning and my nagging suspicions. Before I knew it, it was after five and getting dark. I said my goodbyes and took off through the playground and past the merry-go-round and into the woods. Clouds rolled overhead. If I wasn't foolish enough for walking home during a werewolf crisis, I was certainly fool enough for walking in a storm. When the rain came, it came hard and fast, then eased to a steady shower. This day the sun was gone, rain clouds having forced an early exit, and the path through the woods was uncertain. I ran until my side hurt. I stopped to catch my breath and listen, as Keith and I had done not so long ago. And even though my footfalls stopped, others, maybe behind me, continued on for a few extra steps. I couldn't see anything through the blur of rain. I knew the way ahead, so I quietly resumed, throwing glances behind as I went. The other footfalls kept pace, the crunch of leaves punctuating the steady drum of rain. I had lingered much too long after practice, and now the sun was gone. In its place, the moon rose large over the woods and shined light on the path leading me home. My neighborhood was roughly three miles from school. Amber, Keith, and I used to make the trek in less than an hour, a little longer in bad weather. If we ran the trail, which we used to do from time to time, we could make it in about 40 minutes. I used to brag that I could make it home in the dark, with my eyes closed even. That night, I found out I was wrong. The normal twists and turns of the trail snaked in new directions in the rain and dark. I had no idea I had left the trail. 
I had no idea either that the path the moon showed me that night skirted the chain blocking the way to Oak Mountain. My senses told me I was lost, but I tuned that out. I did the only thing I could and pressed forward, further into the woods of Oak Mountain. I had been picking my way carefully for a while when the wolf howled behind me. I slid along the uneven ground, mud and wet smearing my clothes and hair, rainwater drenching me to the core. I believe the intensity of the rain increased, though that was the least of my worries. The beast had a difficult time as well. I heard it slip and fall a few times, and saplings cracked like bones as it sought to steady itself. I looked back and saw its eyes, two glowing red embers slicing through the dark. Time slowed to a crawl, and I ran for what seemed like hours. I ran until I could run no more. I had reached the cliff's edge. In front of me, a steep drop. Behind, a werewolf. And then, the clouds covered the moon. My side ached with a cramp, and my knees bled from falling again and again. I chanced another look back, and this time saw something unexpected. The beast had stopped on the trail and stood in the open. The town's nightmare turned flesh, blood, and bone. Its shoulders slumped, and its head bent low. I expected to die. I expected to become tomorrow morning's headline. But in the absence of moonlight, the beast lost its power. Or so I reasoned. Whatever the explanation, it began to transform. It shrank in size and girth and lost the fangs and claws that made it what it was. When it finished, it looked up, and I knew the werewolf. She stumbled along the trail, her body covered in mud. She reached out her arms and fell into me and said, Russell, I'm so sorry. For the longest time, I didn't know what to say. Finally, I blubbered. I thought you were dead. When she looked up, her eyes no longer glowing red. They were the same hypnotic blue I knew so well. Not yet, Amber said. She was crying, her tears lost in the relentless rain. She said, I've wanted to tell you for so long, I thought I could be strong enough to let you know. Instead, I've killed people you love. The simple truth is that I can't help what I do. Clouds rolled overhead, and Amber said, I came here tonight to do everybody a favor. I didn't expect to find you here. She checked the sky again, the moon mercifully hidden behind thick, black thunderheads. You've got to hurry, she said. You've got to get far away from me. She tried to turn away, but I held her hand. I had enough time to wonder where the claws went when she looked like this. We stood there at the cliff's edge, she in her bare feet and tattered clothes, and me in my tennis shoes. When you go home, you can tell them what you like, she said. It won't matter to me, because I'll be gone. She took a step closer to the edge. I reached out a hand, but dared not get any closer. Please, I said. Don't do it. Even before I finished speaking, her head was shaking, her eyes cast to the ground. Those stunning blue eyes. There was so much I hadn't known about Amber. So much. There's no other way, she said. She turned from me. When she spoke her last, she looked at me over her shoulder. Promise me something, Russell. Anything, I said. I'll promise you anything. Be the hero, she said. 
Tell them you killed the werewolf. Amber didn't bother to get a running start. She just fell. I scrambled to the edge on hands and knees to see what she had done. A low bank of clouds swirled around the base of Oak Mountain like cotton, shrouding the rocks below. Amber fell towards them at a speed that felt as slow as Christmas. Before she disappeared into the clouds, her body turned and I looked into her soul for the last time. One hand raised to me as if I should reach out and take it. Whether she wanted me to help her or join her, I will never know. Without a sound, Amber slipped into the cloud bank. A swirl of white puffed where she fell, and I dared hope she might yet survive. The dull thud and crack of bone that raced back up the cliff told me all I needed to know. Amber was dead. The werewolf was gone at last. I stood a little too quickly, and my head swam. My knees popped and my hands hurt, so did my heart. I didn't look back over the edge. I knew it was useless. There would be no more killings. Amber had been the only one. Her family had sent her to live in our town, alone, to escape the family's curse. Instead, she brought it with her. Now, the town was free. In time, people might even forget the werewolf was real. But I will never forget. The moon peeked from behind the clouds again, but this time I wasn't afraid. I am the hero of my story, I said to the moon, out loud, because I needed to try Amber's words on for size. I walked home along the tangled path down which my friend had so recently run. I am the hero of my story, I said again, pushing briars from in front of me, breaking saplings when I needed to. I am the hero of my story, I said, because I killed a werewolf. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights 